Great. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the May 2024 edition of AZ BioPeers. AZ BioPeers is a time where we come together to share insights from subject matter experts about topics that will help our life science businesses grow. Today, we'll be discussing talent strategies and ways that we can continue to develop our talent here in Arizona. To start, I'm going to ask our panel to introduce themselves. Brady, would you like to kick things off? Great. Thanks, Dylan. Um, so glad that it's talent to the topic, because if you were to say something like grant writing, I'd have to get off the airplane. <laughs> you know, when you're on the plane and you're like, oh, good, we are going to Dallas. <laughs> we're not going somewhere else. Yes, talent. So thank you so much to, to you and AZ Bio for allowing me to come on here. Um, excited. Uh, I've been 20 years in the corporate world in HR, um, and 17 of those years in corporate, I supported life sciences and startups. These days, um, I have gone out on my own. I run Thrive Coaching and Consulting, and our mission simply is we're talent strategists, and we try to improve uh, talent attraction and retention, very simply. Um, do that a couple of ways. I can be a fractional CHRO providing strategic leadership for small businesses that don't they can't afford a full-time person. Or we can do projects, uh, for instance, diagnosing turnover and then figuring out ways to make improvements. So there's a lot of different ways we can support businesses. Um, so we, we support organizations outside of biotech, but my main focus, honestly, is biotechnology organizations inside and outside Arizona. So anyway, glad to be here, and I'm glad to hear what Ian and Jess have to say as well. Thank you, Brady. Yeah, and Jess, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Good morning, everyone. Jess Scour. I'm a vice president at Radiant Dev, which is a local recruiting firm here in Arizona. I have been in the recruiting industry, gosh, 15 years now, which um, I like to say it's in dog years. So it feels well over 80 years when your product is people and people are very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, I started off my career working mm -hmm. within technology recruitment, and I did a lot with healthcare. So I worked a lot with uh, providers and payers, dipped my toe into that water, wild experience, um, worked my way into some leadership positions with large companies, um, got my dream job, which was running our Atlanta market. I was in charge of, I think, $90 million in revenue. I had 70 direct reports, um, 400 customers thought like, this is the Mecca. I got here in my early thirties. I'm so lucky, but completely hated the job. And all my friends are like, Hey, take this trip to Sedona. It's supposed to be healing. There's vortexes all this wild stuff. So I flew out to Arizona, touched down, and I was like, this is home. Like, this is where I want to be. So within six months, I moved out here and then really found my second love, which is recruiting within this bioscience space. So I've been recruiting here for the past four years. Um, I work with a lot of series A through D companies. So companies that are, are rapidly growing and helping them pretty much figure out a talent strategy. So, so excited to be on this call. I'm glad you guys are making the time for this. It's an extremely important topic. So glad to be here. Thank you. And Eden. Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining today. My name is Eden Higgins, and I'm a, the vice president at Duffy Group. I've been with Duffy Group um, for 24 years. And have uh, prior to that had about 15 years of human resources experience um, at different levels. Um, my love is absolutely recruiting. I think that talent acquisition and um, retention is the, the most important thing. If you get the right people in the door and hire the right people, then your your worries and your problems are are less on the other side. I feel and and I've I've known that and so is Brady, Brady and and Jessica too from managing. Um, so Duffy Group is a little bit different than other recruiting firms. We have a five step model. Um, we are hourly based, which is a lot different than um, contingency or retained. And um, we typically save our clients fifty percent compared to other um, our our uh, competitors. So we're a little bit different and super transparent. And, um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about um, transparency when we go through today, because that's really important when recruiting. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Jess and Brady would, uh, and also Dylan would agree with me, um, but transparency is key. And that's a really big part of our model. Um, as far as areas of expertise, um, we actually are expert recruiters. I know you're like, ha, ha, ha. But we've done, we've done biotech. We've done startups. We've worked with Fortune 500. Um, my area of specialization is the really hard, difficult to fill position. 
I love those because I get to learn. Um, but there's others in our company that like um, sales, that like the executive searches, that like, you know, so um, it depends on what they like and we recruit and, and get that business in. So um, Duffy Group has been here for 30 years. We're based in Arizona, but we do national and international. And i um, super excited to share um, the expertise that I've gained in, I can't even say 40, 40 years. <laughs> oh my goodness, maybe not that long. <laughs> Um, and uh, thank you for coming in and joining the call today. Thank you. And so just as a first question, just want to really kind of get your perspective on how life science kind of startups, you know, resource strapped, how do they really differentiate themselves to attract talent as they're competing with larger, more established companies? I can take this one. So I think I totally understand where a lot of you guys are at, right? You don't have the budget that a Medtronic will have where they have a team of probably 50 talent acquisition people. They have a bunch of recruiting resources that they use, right? So you have to do a lot more with less. Um, I think though that can be your biggest advantage. So I want to talk about what this next generation wants when they're looking for new jobs. There's some crazy stat out there that I think it's 85% of the workforce in 2025 is going to be millennial or under, right? Pandemic completely flipped the way that people want to work. So you got to start thinking, what do these people want to do? How do they want to work? Where do they want to work? Right. So I think your biggest strength in these situations is number one, who you are. If you started a business, if you're running a business, people want to connect with your why. They want to know you as a person. So I think it's very important that you ha have a personal story about who you are and what you want to do. That's the best way to attract talent. I took a job with a company where I took, gosh, a 50% pay cut, but I cried when the CEO talked about how he immigrated into the United States and his story. I wanted to run through a brick wall for this man when I started the job. So be okay with being vulnerable and telling your story as the CEO or owner. Two, and this is a huge advantage for a lot of you guys, is um, people want to work for a company that has purpose. So if your goal is to um, cure cancer, if your goal is to find uh, early detection for Alzheimer's, be bold with that. Come out front and say, hey, this is our purpose. This is what we want to solve for. You got to think when people go home for their like Thanksgiving meal, they want to say, hey, I'm helping cure cancer. Like they, people want to have the purpose. Long gone are the days where you can say, I work at a bank eight to five and that's sexy and exciting, right? <laughs> um, I think number three is where they want to work. This is a huge, huge um, topic nowadays. And hopefully we can talk a little bit more about it. But pandemic flipped this around, right? Everybody started to work from home. And there's all these talks like people weren't productive, work wasn't getting done. It was the complete opposite. People were extremely productive during the pandemic when they can work flexible hours, they can work from home. The thing that they struggled with is mainly the culture. So if you can keep your culture intact and allow people flexible hours, you'll be shocked at how much more talent you can get. So when you're out there attracting talent, it's who you are, it's the purpose of your company, and then allow some flexibility. Um, I think put that all in a really pretty package and, and move it forward. The other thing that this is uh, huge nowadays is social media. 84% of companies have a social media strategy. So I would take that pretty package and I'd push that out through social media. I would do speaking engagements. You know, If you're not good at social media, talk to a 23 year old. If you have somebody on your team that's 23 to 25, they will love the social media strategy. They'll be putting together videos on TikTok, all of that. So I think that's kind of where you can start. And that would be an advantage. You're very nimble and you can adjust and attract the right talent through making it the best work environment possible. Hopefully that makes sense. That's great. And anything to add there, Brady? I think we covered a lot there. I read this Harvard Business article, Harvard Business Review article. They did a study with mission-based organizations. It was more about nonprofits, and they found that yes, putting the mission and kind of what you stand for was really important to people. But if you also added like, and you can grow here, like some sort of like also other part, like that you're going to get out of it in addition to the mission, like. The, the feedback was if we just put mission and what we're doing to help the world by itself, people would take that as like, oh, they don't got anything else. That's all they're leaning on. 
you got to put a message out there that says, yes, we do these think great things for the world. And you personally are going to do well here for X, Y, Z reasons. Uh, at least that was their study. It was in Canada. So maybe we don't want it. We want to discount it because it was Canadian. But uh, but it was just something that really hit me. And I thought we should at least give that some thought as well. Yeah, I think that definitely makes sense. And we talked about kind of the, you know, the millennial and under that pool of talent. And Eden, could you share any insights on how Arizona startups can really enhance their access to, you know, the student population here and leverage this talent pool? Sure. And um, I'd I'm going to, I'd love to get into that, Dylan, but can I say, can I hop on what Jess and Brady were saying real quick Certainly. before I, we get to that? Okay. So, um, when we're doing our intake with our clients, we ask, and it's, it's super corny, but we ask, we ask for their the sizzle. Tell us the sizzle about the job. Why is this job so exciting? And many times, the people that are on the phone, those hiring leaders, those owners, those CEOs, those chief science officers, they you guys totally take for granted what is cool about your company. So Jess is saying like the, the purpose. So that's so important, but there's other things that are important to, um, you know, like, Hey, you get to, um, you have a soft fuzzy chair that you sit in every day or, Hey, we have lunches on Fridays or guess what? We went out to, um, uh, this nonprofit and we all work together to build these things for this, for these ho homeless people. So all these things that you take for granted, you have to kind of jot them down and not forget when you're recruiting because you're constantly selling when you're recruiting and you're, and you're interviewing, you're constantly selling and you're in competition against something that we, you know, the first question, those big companies, you know, I love big companies. They're great to work for, but sometimes their sizzle is not as good as the startups. Okay. And this, the, you know, you can be a cog in a wheel. It can be stable. You know, it's true. Some people like that, but other people really like the, Hey, I can do one of 10 things today. And I know, I don't even know what the 10 things are going to be tomorrow. So remember to that sizzle for each position. And if you don't know it, then ask somebody that's in that role, the good, the bad, and the ugly about that position. And then bring that when, you know, and bring that person and bring those comments in. So I just wanted to bring that up because, you know, just because you have 10 people doesn't mean you can't compete against the big dogs. Because some, some people like little dogs, you know, Dylan has a little dog. I have a Husky. So, you know, we like different kinds of things and there's a lot of different, different people out there um, in recruiting uh, that you're going to recruiting. So back to the question that Dylan asked about the um, access to students and leverage, leveraging that talent pool. Um, when we looked at the people that were going to attend today, some of them were ASU um, career services. I hope they're here and not listening because I'm going to give you a big shout out to for the companies to please look at the local universities, um, talk to the uh, career services, um, go into Handshake, set up a profile, um, Talk to the kids that actually connect with you on Handshake. Don't ignore them because they're they're signing up in Handshake when they're freshmen at ASU. Okay, I don't know about U of A, but they're signing up, and then that's because they want to hear from you. They want to know what's out there. Um, so start developing that relationship any way you can through that those career services. And another one, another way to get into the ASU, um, uh, you know, I would think U of A, NAU, the local people, even like Midwestern University, all the, anything having to do with medical here locally, why don't, um, being a speaker in a class, you know, look at, you know, and I, and I, um, again, my background is like uh, human resources, but I really do like to source and recruit. So how are you going to find those people go on that website for Midwestern? Who's that? What is that? Um, or ASU and, um, what's that, per, what's that professor studying and what are, what classes are they teaching and go into that, tell that professor, Hey, this is what I do. This is my company. I'd like to talk about this. And guess what? That professor gets a day off because you're speaking in the class. Don't you think they'll be excited about that? The answer is yes. And if you're not the person, then get your uh, science um, officer, a scientist, or a, a quality person. There's all different classes available, and they need people from the outside to come in. And when you're there, you bring um, 
a business card or <laughs> if anybody has those anymore <laughs> or one of those like QR codes. So the kids can, they can, they know who you are and then you grab their information. I would still do a piece of paper and everybody knows what a piece of paper is, right? With a pen, <laughs> ask for them to sign up with their contact information and begin the recruiting there in that classroom. They're going to, I mean, talk about purposeful recruiting. It's right. They're learning about quality. They're learning about assay development. They're learning about whatever, whatever you need in that job. They're probably learning or they've heard about it. And those are the kids that are interested. So I would use that and um, ASU has such great resources that I know of. I'm not familiar with the um, other schools. And I did, I have to say, I am a Sun Devil. Go fear the fork. <laughs> but I, I love U of A too because they're biotech. <laughs> but I have to give that little plug. Um, I would also participate. The third thing that I would do is participate in the pitch competitions on campus. Oh my gosh. They're fantastic. And there's pitch competitions that, you know, that they're only biotech, they're only renewable energy, they're only, you know, they're different things. And then there's the grand pitch, right? And uh, venture doubles. Um, I'm a judge, so super fun to be a Shark Tank judge and, you know, love on these kids and just listen to their presentation. But those kids that have the um, courage to present to our entrepreneurs on biotech, Bing, bing, bing. That's somebody that you want in your company. So it's also active recruiting, bringing your cards, bringing your QR code. Um, so those are the three things that, um, that I was mentioning, you know, volunteer as a guest speaker, participate in the pitch contest, and then work with career services. Jess and Brady, do you guys have anything else to add? Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, especially the startup folks, you know, they, they're probably master, they had master's degrees or PhDs. And, you know, maybe they were, um, they had unfettered, you know, those professors have unfettered access to students in their labs because they're professors and run labs. And now you're out on your own. You don't, you don't get that unfettered access anymore. So I, I think I would, I would try to explore some sort of adjunct faculty appointment. So as a collaborator with these professors and then get access to the students in that way, if you can. And do I know how to do that precisely at every college? I don't, but that is something I would, I'd look into so you can still get access to those, to those, especially grad students, right? I mean, this might be a, a shameless plug for AZ Bio, but I had a position <laughs> two weeks ago where I needed a, a research associate, kind of junior, maybe graduate, PhD, maybe. And uh, I called Dylan and Joan and they pointed me in the right direction and we found a candidate within like two days. So shameless plug, but use the resources around you. Your job is to get that position out to as many people as possible. Word of mouth goes very quickly. So reach out to the people that you know within the community. And thank you. Be, yeah, we have our career center. We have a plethora of you know members that we can share the positions with. So Yes, yeah, certainly. Reach out to everyone in your network. And now kind of moving on to as we think about, you know, creating a position, we think about the hiring process. So if we're thinking about, you know, a position, what elements really contribute to a compelling employee value position or proposition, like especially in the life science sector? And really, how will that impact, you know, talent retention and establishing you know, an attractive position? Uh, do you, can I take this? First, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. So you were talking about in, in employee value proposition. A lot of people don't know what that is. Um, perhaps they don't know what that is. Uh, basically an EVP, you go to a company and you're giving them your talents, your effort, your education, you give them that and in trade, they give you the components of an, in, in a, of a value proposition, employee value proposition. Um, and that could be um, things like, you know, of course, salary benefits, bonuses, equity, um, but, or I should say, and a lot of non-compensatory things that I think a lot of people forget. Time off, flexibility, work-life balance, access to leadership. Actually, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, training, uh, the organizational reputation, the impact on society, as was what was mentioned before, maybe recognition, growth potential, the culture, like there's all these things that actually don't cost anything that 
are of real value to human beings. They say people don't leave jobs, they leave managers. Did I say they leave salary? No, they leave managers. And a lot of the stuff you can get to um, and improve upon on your EVP. And honestly, every company already has one. You already have a value proposition. You just need to know what it is. So if you're a startup, um, let me, let's me let think about this. You're a startup, you can't offer maybe top line Medtronic level salary. All right, but maybe you can lean into the fact that and this was said earlier, everybody, uh, that every day you would get more wild experience every single day versus the small cog in a big wheel, right? I mean, that's something. Um, the growth potential from that experience is way harder, way higher than in a larger company. Um, maybe you can provide more flexibility. Maybe you're the type of, your, your leadership style is to spend time with everyone. Uh, honestly, most companies, big companies can't say that the founder is going to spend any time with you. Are you kidding? In big companies, sometimes your supervisor doesn't mentor you and spend time with you. I mean, so this is a huge value, especially if we're talking about the students. They want this early value in their lives. Um, so a lot of this, like, you're like, oh, well, yeah, that's really obvious that I can offer that. But I tell you what, it's probably not obvious to who you're trying to attract. So what I can, the advice I can give you is, like never undersell, never think you're overselling these benefits. Okay. Never think, just throw those things out there. Be really, really obvious that these are the things you can get here. Um, another thing about EVP that's important is it's not going to, um, not everyone's going to like it. You're not going to attract everyone. And that's fine. Okay. Wow. This person's resume is amazing. I got to have them. If they don't jive with what you got, they're not going to be engaged. They're not going to be performing at a high level. I promise you, if you get somebody and wait for them that has what you want, that follows your values, and by the way, values are important too, they get the right resume, they have the right value set, um, they jive on your EVP, you're going to get way better engagement, way better performance, and a whole lot longer tenure, I promise you. So I would I wait for that. So I think the big answer in all this is almost more than anything else, don't hire people who don't like what you have just because they have what you want. Um, they got to want what you want and wait for it. I'm going to add a, a thing to that because I love what you said, Brady. I think there's a lot of talk right now around transparency with the way that you're paid. So salaries is a big topic. It used to be where companies would not be transparent with how much the pay is. Be bold with how much you can pay. If somebody's in it for a higher salary, a bump in the salary, they might not be a right person. So lead with the EVP and be transparent around the, the pay and you will attract the right person. Thank you. And I want to yeah. kind of jump to uh, salary. So I know, Brady, you mentioned salary. And could you share really any tips or techniques for navigating kind of the salary negotiations for prospective employees, especially in a startup setting? Uh, yeah, I, I could. Um, does anyone want to take this? Jess, you didn't want to take another I'll take that one. I'll yeah, take that could, one a yeah, little bit, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, you know, that's as a recruiter, um, you know, we're <laughs> Jess and I are always <laughs> in the middle of the salary negotiations a lot of times. So um, I think, and Jess already mentioned this, uh, transparency is key. Uh, having a, um, you know, but sometimes I think maybe somebody here on this call or somebody that will listen to it later, maybe you don't know what, what you can pay or you know what you want to pay, but you don't know what the market is. I'm going to give you some sneaky ways to figure out what the market is. Write this down. All right. So you, you have your title, you know what you're looking for. Let's say it's a quality systems engineer uh, and you have a, a few things that you need. Get that on to indeed.com. Those are what you're looking for. You can put Arizona in and then you can see what the salary ranges. Now in Arizona, we don't have to post the salary. So go national and then do California and then back into it by figuring out the cost of living differential, back into it. And then you kind of know what the market is a little bit. You can do your own little market survey on Glassdoor. You can do it on um, Indeed and kind of figure it out a little bit what it smells like in the market. Um, that's what we do for our clients. If they don't know what they're paying, 
or if they don't know what to pay, we will kind of do some research to see what the market is. Um, and then, you know, the, the great question when you're um, the salary negotiation, I think um, be upfront and ask the person to be honest. Um, the candidates say, you know, this is what we're thinking the, the range would be. Um, is that something that you'd be interested in? And, you know, it's a little bit waffly. We don't know. We kind of, this is a new position for us. Um, we're thinking of paying a um, million to two million a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Would that be all right with you? And then a hundred percent bonus, you know, so just, uh, you know, just to, to, to be honest, uh, this is what we're thinking. Um, we're not quite sure what, where you will land on that because, uh, the position is anywhere from one year to five years of experience. And of course, if somebody has five, we're going to pay more. If they have the PhD, we're going to pay more, et cetera. It's a sliding scale, but we're going to be, be, um, you know, just be honest and transparent. Um, but start, start with that little bit of market research that you have when you, when you kind of set your salary, um, you don't have to have it on the job description in Arizona, you know, but other places do. And that's where you can grab that information. And other, a lot of companies are, um, posting it, even though we don't have to. And I have had candidates say to me, well, that's not fair. Why aren't they telling me what they're paying? So the apps, so the distrust that starts when a company does not put the salary in is crazy now. You know, five years ago, we didn't know what things paid. Nobody knew. Now, because of the, the transparency laws across the United States, it's coming, starts on the coasts, right? All those, the laws, and then they, they're starting to close in. And Arizona is one of the last holdouts. Maybe we don't have to do it yet, but guess what? Everywhere else does. So the candidates see that. So I, I, I recommend that you put a range. You know, it can be low to kind of high. And then, you know, and people are like, well, that's not fair. Well, it depends on, it depends on, you know, the type of in experience that you have. So that's one thing. Begin with something idea. So you have in your mind what your company can afford in that role. And then also what, what's the budget maybe for the role or for that department and back into it that way. And then you can figure that, that out with the market data for the, um, so you, you have in your mind. So then you have these, this, you have a million, hundred million candidates that come in. They're all great. They're all interested in you. You find the, the one, like Jessica and Brady said, there's one person that you love, right? Just be honest. Again, continue the transparency. We really think you're great and uh, we're looking to make an offer. What would you feel would be accepting? You know, and then also just a, a shameless plug for Jessica and I, if you use the recruiter, <laughs> we can help you with this negotiation <laughs> a little bit on the side. Okay. So um, either you have to do it internally and again, transparency is key. Transparency is key to be honest with the people up front and if you don't have something that is the base is huge because you're a, a small startup, the value, the proposition that um, Brady was saying, everything that Jessica was saying, the benefits, the environment, the access to everything you can, that's, even though money is important to everybody, that's why we work is, I mean, we have to pay bills, you know, the candidates, all of us have to pay bills. That's why we work. It's an important part, but it's not the only thing. So in salary negotiation, I think it's very, very important. I'm going to go back to it to be very, um, to start with something in mind, to be honest and transparent and move forward that way all along the process. Um, something also in this market, even though, I mean, the market's tight, it's hard to find great employees and they're always being um, uh, called by crazy recruiters like Jess and I asking them about other roles when they're employed, when they're looking. So, so a candidate that you bring into the process and you have them, you know, that's that candidate that you love. You have to ask them about, Hey, uh, do you have anything else that you're interviewing for? It's a scary question at first. It's scary. Are you actively looking and pursuing other opportunities? If they say yes, you can say, what's the salary that you're looking for with the other company? What are they offering? Are they, how do I rank? You know, how does Duffy Group rank according to uh, compared to AZ Bio? You know, so let's see where you're ranking. See what you have to do. What what do I have to do to to bring you move move you forward? You know, 
Um, and then there's another thing that you all, I know with startups and smaller companies and even larger, there's, um, you have options. There's shares that are open, you know, that you can, sh you can share in the wealth of the company. You can share in the success of the company with your employees, which, it, which is a huge thing. It doesn't always pay out. I've been a winner and a loser in this end. I think we all have. Um, but there is a, 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 a website called Carta, C-A-R-T-A dot com. I don't get paid. It's not a plug for them. I don't get a commission or anything on this, but I really like the information because it's some, some of it's free at the beginning. That's how they pull you in. Um, but they, it's a stock option and um, compensation by position and little startup size of the company. And you can kind of do a little bit of a research there to see if you're thinking stock options, like what's the, what are, what are p companies that are in my industry in my, um, thank you, Dylan, for putting that in the chat. Um, what are the companies in my industry and what are they offering? And if you, you can't see, you can see that they're competitors, but just by size, you won't know the name of them. But that's a really nice resource um, to point to for the other things that are in addition to salary. So thanks for letting me talk about that. Jessica and Brady, do you guys have anything else to add? I, I have something because you kind of touched on this a little bit, Eden. I think it's important when you're going out and you're attracting talent, every interaction you have, it's a courting situation, right? I'm courting yes. you. I'm vibing you out to see if you like me, but I'm also trying to present myself in a way that you'd want to work for, for our company. And I think a lot of times larger companies, and once again, this is no offense to larger companies, they kind of lose some of that intimate like courting situations. This sounds crazy. I don't know how many of you guys have dated, but if you've been in the dating world in the last five to 10 years, it's wild. There are a lot of options at your fingertips. You have access to a lot of people and usually the best people are getting courted a lot, right? So think of it as if you're dating, um, it, you want to communicate with that person. You want to say, Hey, this is what our interview process looks like. Hey, I really enjoyed the interview. Thank you for interviewing with us. You want to give them feedback on the interview. There's too many times where I see someone interview and then that company doesn't get back in touch with them for two weeks. That person's long gone. They're no longer interested yes. in position, right? So this is according. Here's another mistake I see. Um, you sit down in an interview and you're just like, pounding people with questions. It's like 20 questions. It's like an interrogation. You get more out of interviews when you're having it be a back and forth conversation. Once again, you're courting this person, they're courting you. So try to think of it in that way. The best talent is going to get a lot of solicitations. You need to make them want to work for your company. And a great way to do that is through that interview process. And to Eden's point, transparency, tell people what you have, what you can offer and allow them to make the decision. I'm just like, I'm such a pet peeve with that stuff, but. I love everything you guys said was, was spot on, uh, on the pay transparency thing. I, I co-authored a, um, an article with a, a compensation consultancy recently. And we like, we wanted to point out that yes, Arizona is not subject to pay transparency on job descriptions, but nine other States are, and then there's city cities inside of other States that are. So it really is coming. So I'm with you. If for no other reason, just get used to the habit of putting that out there because it's coming and you don't want to be caught off guard. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's it really makes sense. Being as transparent as possible as someone that, you know, recently I was on the like looking for, you know, another position and I found AZ Bio, but it's really hard to trust a lot of the companies if they don't really share a lot of the information there. And so now kind of moving on, we have our candidate, They we have them hired. And how do we make sure, like we talked about how many options they have, how do we really make sure that as we're onboarding them, we make sure this process is smooth? And how is our company culture really going to influence the work that they're doing? I actually, I love this question because I think onboarding is something that gets lost in the mix, right? You hire, you got this, we'll use another analogy. You got this, you bought this Ferrari. You got the best one. You shopped around forever. You got this Ferrari, you get them on board and then they sit in your garage for the first two to three months, right? Onboarding usually gets lost in the shuffle, right? It becomes priority number 10 on your list. So there are things that you want to think about when you're onboarding. And I usually, I, I say there should be two goals. One is that you get the person excited about the job. 
So even before the person starts, it's okay to take him to lunch and say, hey, I'm excited to have you on board. It's okay to have them meet with the team or shadow one of your team meetings. You want them to feel excited to work for your company. The other thing that I would say is be really clear on expectations. Nobody starts a job and is like, I want to bomb this job within the first 30 days. Usually people come in and they're excited to work for your company. They want to please you. So be really clear. Hey, this is what the first 30 days looks like, 60 days, 90 days. By year one, you should be in this situation. By year two, I want to get you promoted. I want to get you into a bigger role, right? You want them to be excited. You got your Ferrari. Like, let's rev up the jets a little bit. Um, I don't know. Do jets, jets have a part <laughs> of the engine? You guys got it. Um, and then number two, and this is the harder piece is you want them to be able to onboard autonomously, right? You don't have time. You don't have 40 hours a week for that person to, um, shadow you and do all of that. So where I've seen companies do a really good job is they create this checklist. It's like, Hey, week one, I want you to read this publishing, this article, talk to this person, do research on this. Week two, I want you to do this. Like if you almost give them a checklist so they can do some of it on their own, work will continue to get done without you being in the picture the entire time. And then it's important that you're setting cadence with that person. So it's like week one, here's what I want you to do. We're going to jump on a call Friday and we're going to talk through how it went. I'm going to ask you how you're doing, how you're liking the job, all of that. So have them do some of that work autonomously so that they can um, be productive faster and you're not holding hands throughout the entire process. But onboarding is super important, right? Get their Ferrari and get them out of the gate strong. There's a crazy stat out there, by the way, that within six months of somebody starting a job, they're already looking for their next position. Like it's insane. So like you have to really keep your talent once you get them. And I'd like to hop on what Jessica was saying. Um, uh, some of our clients, they, um, they don't hire one by one. And I know you never know how many you're going to um, have come on board at once, but it's really nice to have a buddy when you're joining a new team. Oh my gosh. If you have two of the same position and they're all going to be going into train there, that it's a nice to have an onboarding buddy. Um, even if they're not on the same team, it's still okay. Cause there's a lot of stuff that the company information, the benefits, the, um, the culture part, you know, um, meeting the different departments, how it works to have somebody to go through those, those first couple of days is really an integral, um, part. And then, um, I, I know, uh, I, a buddy system, I think is very important. Um, having a mentor, Gosh, you know, I know that as a manager and you're the hiring manager, hiring these people, but having somebody have a mentor that maybe a, if it's an associate, a senior associate that kind of checks in with them and um, something else that Jess mentioned, uh, you know, having that um, conversation with them once they start, you know, once a week, it's not just for um, us to, and I'm just saying, cause this, what I would do is like, okay, check off, check off, check off. Okay. Let, check, 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 check. Did you do this? Did you do this? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> We need to listen. We need to listen. What do you think about this? And then how can we make it better? How can we make it better for you in your first week? Because these, these uh, millennials, these next generation, the newbies, whatever they're called, Z, A, whatever, <laughs> alpha. Gen Z, Gen Z, they, yeah. They want to be heard. They want to be heard. And you could say, okay, I appreciate the fact that you want to um, have free lunches every day, but we're not able to do that. But thanks for that information. <laughs> Would you like to cook for your team tomorrow? <laughs> so uh, they want to be heard. They want to be heard. So um, I, you know, I, thanks Jess for letting me uh, pipe in on that. Good point. Yeah, definitely. It's, I can definitely see how important that is. And then really just making sure that they feel comfortable communicating as well. I think yeah, having those kind of early meetings will really help them feel comfortable asking a question rather than being too nervous to say anything as they're trying to, you know, get used to their job. Mm -hmm. Something that we do too, is when we're talking to them and we're, we're engaging as a, um, with a candidate, we ask them, what are you looking for in your next role? I don't want to talk to you about this one until I know what you are looking for. So, um, and I kind of joke around and say, uh, uh, okay, so are you in a purple prickly chair right now staring at a corner? Do you like it? And they, they may say yes, right? Or they may complain to, 
to me about, I'm in a purple prickly chair and I'm staring at a corner. And then I'm, and I'm, then I say, Dylan, I'm sorry. I only have a purple prickly chair today, but there's a window right next to the corner. Would that be okay? You know, so you just, again, transparency and honesty all the way through and then circling back that you, you hire them, you onboard them circling back. Hey, you said you were looking for this in your next role. Are we delivering? Do you see that here? Do you see, is there hope that you're going to get there to that five-year, you know, spot? And not after the, just the first week, you know, the second, third, fourth, you know, month actually. And something that um, I, I'm going to do a shameless plug for Duffy Group. 95% of the people that we place stay for over a year. And it's because of the transparency. You know, we, we make sure that they understand what they're getting into and our clients, we have our clients explain what they're getting into because it doesn't help anybody to stay for 30 days. Like Jess, Jessica said, they're unhappy. They're, they're looking again. And you know what? They're called all the time by us, all the time. <laughs> and we're trying to sell them a bag of goods. This is why you need to leave. This is why you need to leave. Well, you guys need to sell internally. This is why you need to stay. This is why you need to stay. And not just when they get another offer, but just every day. Happy that you're here. This is great. You know, and I know that there's work to be done. Oh my gosh, we all know that. We all work, you know? So work to be done, but um, just kind of addressing their concerns and help, hopefully filling in their issues and such. So thank you. Thank you. And I want to just be sure to cover, like we know the goal is to grow. The goal is to grow and we know things aren't going to st stay the same as we grow as a company. So what are some common growing pains that you've seen that, you know, are experienced by startups and how have you, how could you think to really address them to try to ensure that long-term success? Growing pains. Yes. I have a 14 year old. My legs hurt. Yeah. Oh yeah, pal. Cause you just grew six inches uh, this calendar year. No, I've seen that a lot. I've, as I mentioned, uh, I've worked with a lot of startups at, as they mature into bigger organizations. Um, there's probably two or three things uh, that come to mind. Um, one, honestly, is 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 not having a plan just from the get go. And, I'll, and I'll, I guess I'll frame it. Not having a plan generally is a bad idea, but I guess I'll frame it more on the talent side. Um, I get you have to be flexible and pivot with opportunities. I and I think that's a really good thing. But, you know, let's say you're bidding on a project or writing a grant and you kind of get a sense for what you're going to, you know what you're going to need talent wise. That's the minute to start thinking about looking for those people and coming up with a plan. That's the minute, not the minute you get the money nine months later from the NIH. Now's the time to think about how am I going to get those people, get a plan in place. The minute you get the money, execute on the plan or get your feelers out there earlier. So just generally having a plan um, creating infrastructure. If you know you get that series of funding and you're going to go on this growth curve and you've been doing everything via paper and on Excel sheets or whatever, you, you know, and and you don't and you've just been interviewing by gut feeling, um, you got to come up with infrastructure and processes that are repeatable. Everyone knows what you're doing. The communication channels are alive and well in between people as you're looking to recruit. As a for instance or you could add in any other operational thing that you need to do in your business, in your research enterprise. But yeah, get in front of that. Um, I work with clients all the time. They're like, we're about to grow. Sometimes I get in there, we're growing, help me. It's too late, well, it's not too late, let's go for it. But like, we're about to grow, that's the perfect time to get the foundation set up. So have a plan. Um, this is a hard one. The people, the second one's a hard one. Uh, the people that helped you start the organization aren't necessarily always going to be the people that help you run it later when you're mature, right? These are people who can run, excuse me, a mile, you know, 10 miles, you know, 20,000 miles an hour. The people who are generalists that can juggle all this stuff, right? Um, they're great in a startup, but at some point you as the leader need to take your hands off and let deep dive, you know, professionals take certain aspects of your business and manage those functions. And your generalists who can juggle 15 balls are not the right people. So you need to make those decisions. Um, it's okay that they don't stay at your organization anymore. 
Because honestly, if they're very good at spinning plates, then they should go off and spin plates somewhere else and they'll be fulfilled. So you're not doing them a disservice by helping them move on. You're doing them a service, trust me. Um, and you'll feel better. And at the end of the day, they'll feel better. Um, a really good example. So I worked in a research enterprise and uh, you know this is a good example of how two people are not the same. Um, if you're in research mode and you're dabbling and you're trying and experimenting, that same technician is going to be terrible when you turn into a production-oriented clinical lab. They just they can't pipette over and over and over again. They can't because they're experimenters. Let them go experiment and then hire people who are great clinical lab people that just can follow the recipe. So just an example. Um, and I know I'm getting wordy. The final thing as a founder, because I know we have a few startups here, folks, you've got to let go. Um, you just you just have to you have to set up processes again that you're in touch with 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 the details without getting into the weeds. Does that make sense? You can see the weeds, but you're not micromanaging the weeds. And so if you can come up with those systems and processes, boy, you're going to be in a lot better place than if you have to, if you feel you have to touch everything all of the time, you're never going to grow. You're going to be the biggest impediment. So get really great people, work with people like just and you can find great people, work with people like me to get good infrastructure in place and then let those people shine for you. I love that. I'll say another pitfall, and this kind of goes back to hiring. It touches a little bit on what you're saying, Brady, is um, everybody has biases. Like you have to be very much in check with your biases as you're hiring. I've seen startups where there's 10 people and you look at where the 10 people came from, they all came from the same lab at ASU. They all came from, from the Bio Design Institute, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of look up and you're like, where's our diversity? Where's people coming in, giving us different ideas? So be aware, not everybody that you hire has to be a molecular biologist or have that background. It's okay to hire somebody with a different degree or from a different institution or that not from the same company. Be very aware of your biases. You tend to hire people that are exactly like you. It's like what we do. It's familiar familiarity bias. So try to be aware of that and get diversity when you're going out. Cause that's kind of how you can go to that, that next level and continue to evolve as a company. And I'll hop on with what Jess and Brady said. Um, um, Brady was mentioning the systems and, um, you know, that a person that you start the company with not is not necessarily the person that will take it moving forward into production. And, um, I've been reading or listening to a book called Traction, um, and that's by Gino Wickman, and it, it covers the an entrepreneurial operating system, EOS, and at first I'm like, this is going to be corny. It is fantastic, and it covers a lot of the things that Brady mentioned and Jessica mentioned about culture and setting it up and having the right person in the right place and leaving your hands out of it as an entrepreneur, you don't have to do everything. So any entrepreneurs here or anybody running a company that's, you know, not um, a huge fortune 50, <laughs> I think can, can ac absolutely learn from it. It, um, it has a lot of great tips and tricks and scorecards and et cetera, et cetera, how to make your company um, a little bit more organized and transparent too along the way. So just a little plug for that book that I love. And I, I'm listening to it, not reading it. So <laughs> it's on Audible. <laughs> it, it is really good. I agree. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. It looks like we had a question about like, how and where to find a reasonable wage. And then particularly, someone's looking for, you know, a contractor, maybe not a, you know, a salaried employee, but a how would they really try to decide or find where maybe a fair wage for a commission? You didn't kind of touched on that. Yeah, 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 I think you touched on that, like really just looking at Glassdoor, looking at Indeed and just trying to balance based on those. Those are like kind of the main resources that you've seen kind of the go-to resources. But I'd also ask the person like if there's a, and it was Michelle that brought that up. Um, so if, if there's a, if there is a, uh, an individual that you that you actually are speaking with that is a contractor, ask them what they want. You know, I know that sounds crazy, but say, you know, here's here's what I'm thinking about. This is what I've done my research on. This is what I'm thinking about paying for my company. And um, 
How does that sound to you? And, and, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of salespeople and things to sell and the motivation. Um, I know this is kind of, I'm going to go down a tiny rabbit hole here, but whatever is going to make your company profitable, what's the goal? And then your commission structure needs to mimic that goal, right? So if you want high volume, then the commission structure has to be around volume. If you want um, high number of customers, but not necessarily a high volume, then the commission structure has to has to mimic that and mirror that. I'm not a compensation expert, but I am in sales and I have managed sales and hired for sales. And when the company's goals are, are um, in line with and in the direction of the commission structure for the salespeople, that's when it sinks. That's when the company soars. If it doesn't, and that's when you get some things that happen that are not so pleasant on the backside. <laughs> so, thank you, um, thank you. I think the one thing no one said here is go ask somebody, right? Go yeah, yeah. ask your peers. What are they paying for these for these roles? Um, Jess and Eden may not want me to say this, but boy, I call my friends in recruitment all the time to say, "What are you paying these people out there?" Because they know. Just go exactly. ask. Exactly. They'll take, I'm sure you guys will take the calls like, oh Absolutely. yeah, we're paying. This is what we, we placed five people last week and this is what they were paid. Cause you know, in real time, not like online necessarily where who knows how old the data is, but you know, real time. And so I would say, ask people around you and they'll tell you, most people will tell you. I was going to say that two recruiters will die to speak with you. They just want to <laughs> talk to you. So to call a recruiter, they can tell. I have, I have seven med device sales positions open right now. I could talk all day about how the different commissions work and how you attract mm -hmm. sales people. So don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call a recruiter too. They will exactly. gladly speak with you. Exactly. And we do, as part of our projects, we gather that information and share that information with our clients. So it's crazy. We give them a spreadsheet and say, okay, here's what your competitors are paying. These are the people that you want. This is what they're paying and um, have at it, you know? And then you can kind of, our clients typically, I mean, sometimes there's a shift, you know, oh shoot, these top competitors are paying this. We're going to have to move it, you know? So we're, you know, ask the recruiters because we know, we know what's actually getting the people into the door to, you know, to you, to other companies. We know. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much, Brady. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Eden. Really appreciate you sharing your insights, really getting to get a, you know, a deep dive into talent and how we can continue to, you know, make sure we're able to bring talent into our companies here in Arizona. And thank you to everyone for joining us today for AZ Bio Peers. Also, be sure to keep a lookout, be sure to apply for the AZ Bio Awards, be sure to apply for the White Hat Life Science Investor Conference. So take care and we'll see you next month for AZ Bio Pierce. Take care, everybody.